they deserve every quarter they get, and I'm really proud of them. Leeds United were 4 1 winners away at Plymouth and will meet the winners of this evening's replay between Aston Villa and Chelsea in the next round. Leeds midfielder Ilya Gruev says it'll be a huge occasion, whoever they get. It's going to be a big game. Um, either Chelsea or Aston Villa to play, uh, to play such a Premier League level. Aston Villa are doing so great this year, and Chelsea is such a good club. So we're really looking forward um, to the next uh, match in their makeup. All live commentary of Chelsea's trip to Villa Park here on Five Live from 8 o'clock this evening. The commentary were 4 1 winners over Sheffield Wednesday. Up next for the Sky Blues, the lowest ranked team left in the competition, Mason United. Rugby Union and England are hoping to welcome Ellis Genge back into the starting lineup for Saturday's Six Nations matchup with Wales and Twickenham. The Bristol Bears prop was a late withdrawal from last weekend's opening win over Italy in Rome with a foot issue. Meanwhile, Scotland will be without long reaching Gray and back row Luke Crosby for the rest of the tournament after both picked up injuries in last weekend's tight win over Wales. In tennis, Andy Murray's difficult start for the new season continued with a straight set loss to the Czech world number 66, Thomas Machak, in the first round of the ATP 250 event in Marseille. And the British pair of Lois Toulton and Andreas Spendolini Sirius were nine involved in the 10 metre synchronised event on day five of the World Aquatics Championships in Dover. Try this month's Radio 2 and he is doing something very special. Radio 2 Piano Room Live. Some of our favourite artists are joining us at the Red Bell Studios. I'm Johnny Carlos from Elbow. I'm Pete Pino. I'm Pete Sir from the New Zealand. Your unique live performance is alongside the BBC Concert Orchestra. This is Radio 2 Piano Room Live. Thank you. 
we all now know this story. You know, the most amazing thing about that too is that story of Mamanis, only one story of resilient women and kids in this country. It happened to a lot of us that had to get in the They were determined to get home one way or another, and they did. So when she decided, well, she asked the Anna's permission in the days permission to write the story, which then said they had me had their story out there. And then, of course, then Mum, she took them for hours every day with her pen for pages and pages of paper. And in the end, said, you know, Mum, we have to, it's easy for me to type with this story. Well, we can't do that. I can get it for two I ended up typing most of the manuscript after that from um, their old computer she had. And for me, it was a journey of, mm, how do I say, discovery, but it was also a very extremely painful for me reading about what had that happened to my, my grandmother and, and my sister. But I just, I always describe how it felt to read those words, you know, particularly when you read the um, documented government records and old newspaper clippings. It was almost like the government of the day and the police were hunting for three animals. They weren't actually, you know, spoken about three little girls. It was almost like we want our property back. So that was really hard. And for mum, I, towards the end, when the towards the end of the manuscript, I said, how do you feel, mum? She said, well, you know what? It's been a frenzying time for me because I've had time to reconcile myself with what happened to my mum, to them. And I had no, no bitterness towards anybody. I'm angry that I lost a lot of time with my parents, but it's a part of my therapy, my hearing is to write this manuscript. And I can bear no fault that, so this is, writing that book was one of the biggest things that mums have done to set aside ever since the last. No, I've got to do this. Did you know this? I've got angry.
all his work is to do them. So one day when I can say, Philip, you're in the world. So by the time that you learn, then I'm supposed to stand there and go to Nana and Daisy, go all the way to Jubilee and talk to them, told them he's going to make a movie, and they were just, they were just, Nana and Nana they didn't want to be the same. I just went to the white and seen the background and that was me when I had been in the world, that's for sure. It was determined that their story and their place was shown around the world. So yeah, he, he was amazing too because he spent a lot of time with the family, okay with the family. And then they started, when they started filming, my brother that actually worked on the film, he was, she was the armourer charge of all the firearms on the set and also a consistent sort of um, cultural matters. So yeah, he worked on the film and Mum and I thought it was a charter of flight every few days. So Mum and I would go through what they shot and sort of, you know, approve it or, or you know, get it to make some changes or we all had a say in how, how the film is going. So he approved us buying our family the community if you were in, in making the movie so it was awesome. And when it was finished, um show me did it uh your mother for your great aunt and the baby, the whole community, that was a big 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 event trying to get it and we it was huge. There's lots of communities that came in from the public communities, from all the surrounding communities, there's there's a big community that was came in as well because I've never seen so many people in Japan, but it was almost like they were um, a Hollywood dance. And my man and the Daisy were the centre of the mission. They had the you know, trees and blood in the middle. Uh, the Australian Army were involved. They came up with a portable um, cinema screen put up. It was the first time it was a film that was ever shown anywhere in the world. So that was the actual premiere of the Rebel Tanks. And that was in a tiny little community on the edge of the Western Desert. They were just like two little girls and they kept going, oh my gosh, they were, they were so embarrassed, they were more embarrassed than anything else. Because you know, there were so many international journalists there as well, and they were concerned with the central attention, they just, just didn't know how to react to all the attention. But the way they held themselves when they were walking through this area to take the scene, they were like two queens walking through their, their subjects. Smile and it was absolutely It was probably a moment that me or my family would never forget, including our children. It was the best, yeah, what was the best decision that sort of been made is to actually come here that made me jiggle on the her. The whole community. Doris and Maria promoted the film around the world and drew attention to the damage that had been done to the indigenous people of Turkey. Having fought for her own daughters and her baby, Doris went on to become an activist for Aboriginal rights. Maria picked up the mantle of her own daughter, Nisi, the grandmother. You lost your mind.
the great nation of Jefferson's descended there in 1966. children. He has just and he last week graduated from the university with a master's degree in literature. She was a great exposure of grandmothers from the history she got from that. Go through that with support of the family. So yeah, it's been my daughter who's a Mrs. Sam, she's got a master's in literature. These girls in all their strength and have wild women in this family. So yeah, there you go. There was no way in the world that kids in this family would ever lose touch with the women, the strong women in this family that have come before us. They have their witnesses and it's on a continuous on that region. Maria Perkins has become an extremely good member of the family. Grandmother Molly escaped from the institution of one. And her mum does come and wrote the book for her books to her family. Out this time and then out tomorrow. You're listening to the BBC World Service and now witness history with me, Vicky Barton. I'm taking you back to 2003 when one of Nigeria's first female Muslim women saved a young mother in a gruesome punishment. Just 30 years old and sentenced to death by public stoning, her only crime giving birth to her daughter out of wedlock. In 2002, the family allowed a divorced mother from a rural village in northern Nigeria was convicted of adultery in an Islamic Sharia court. The truth of having your own strongly friends and I have a lot of good for it. That power is a a human rights lawyer for the record of the ending people in severe punishment. On hearing about the unique case from a BBC journalist, she visited the young mother's village to see if she would like her help, but the initial meeting did not be expected. And I spoke to Amina, she had a baby. As she had a bit of an attitude, the thing I took up in were you surprised by the Amina's attitude? No, I wasn't, because the issue of having a pregnancy and a work life is a shame of the community we are taking from when we have to sit on the country. Oh, I was the first woman lawyer to come from Gotham College in Nigeria. As a Muslim who had grown up with similar circumstances to her life, she felt uniquely placed in the country. So I mean, I think it's how my business can be so to have you to write on it. Not that this is my part of the economy, and the issue of women, and the issue of women, and the issue of women, and the issue of women. Ten days later, there was a phone call. Somebody who was seen to say this more so, they would be somebody who was speaking to me, so probably born in the night, in that region. So she held the court upside down. And the man was saying to her, I'm going to the phone, it's done with it. I was saying, So I said, Who is it? He said, My name is Amina. And after some time, I came up to her. She was sitting down in the night that she was having the public transport. I didn't know what she was doing. She sat down in the night that was coming. I sent my driver. And the description was sitting here where she was wearing a green hijab. And she was sitting next to the public room in the mouth of the person holding a white bag, white plastic bag. So that was the description of you know, Muhammad and I died and went to pick her up and then I brought her in the house where I was hired and took off the keys. And then that he was divorced and had six other children, told her about her story. She said she had been raped. Her death sentence had been handed down in the Sharia courts. She was not the first woman in Nigeria to face such a punishment, but her case attracted huge international attention as it coincided with the country's attempt to host a mixed world peace pageant. Several of the contestants could have boycotted the event entirely in support of Amina, including Miss United States Rebecca Reckon. 